book I've been reading, Good Enough, in the chapter called Exile, they begin with this story about a saint. Now, if you know anything about saints, we have saints for everything, right? They, they can be for whatever you need them for. You will find a person that represents them. So the saint they begin with is the saint for those who feel excluded and exiled, who feel like they don't belong. Her name is Saint Rose. And when she was three, she brought her light, aunt, aunt back to life. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was three, that was definitely not what I was doing. By the time she was seven, she was also beginning to experience this feeling that God had a purpose for her life. And she started living an ex, um, a life that was influenced by what it would be to be a nun. And so in an aesthetic life where she, in her own life at seven, was doing the things that a re really religious person would be doing. As she grew into that faith, she had a near-death experience, and she started to pledge herself with the Franciscans who were in her area. And she began to feel this call on her life to preach to the community. And so she would go out into her town in Italy, and she would share the good news and the promises of God with them, carrying the crucifix with her, and her preaching got her family kicked out of town because there was a war going on between the Pope and the Emperor, and she chose the side that the town didn't like, and so they kicked her out, let the family back in once the Pope won the war. But her real goal was to become part of the poor Claire's. She wanted to join their order. But here's the irony. She was too poor to be a poor Claire. Because she didn't have a dowry. She came from a very poor family, and so she had nothing to give the poor Claire's in order to join them. And so when they rejected her, she said, when I die, you will miss me and regret this decision. But she didn't live a long life. At 17, she died, and eventually the poor Claire's did regret their decision. But she has become the saint for those who feel like they don't fit in, don't belong, have been exiled and rejected. In fact, the irony is that now every year in her town of Vetrebo, I think it was, Italy, the entire community comes out to celebrate her birthday with a huge parade for her of welcoming the lost. And that's what our story in the scripture today is about, right? What happens when you're lost? It's the story of two lost sons. The first son is the one who didn't fit, right? Is the one who decided he needed to leave home because home wasn't the place where he felt like he could be himself. And so he left. He left and sought his fortunes, but he got in with the wrong crowd. Because I don't know if you know when you enter a community, and I watched this happen with me and then my son, because as a pastor's kid, you move a lot. That the first people who approach you to be your friends are the last people you should be friends with. Because they're the ones who usually are going to get you in the most trouble because they don't have friends, right? And so I imagine that the first lost son when he went to the place where he thought he could become who he saw in his head, the other people all had their friends already. And so he got in with the wrong crowd, the people who didn't 
who led him down a path of destruction. It says his brother accuses him of prostitutes. But what it says is he had desolate living. In other words, he was doing whatever in that community was at the edge, right? Was he drinking? Was he partying? Was he doing drugs? Was he gambling? He was living at that space that wasn't what the community expected. But then the money ran out. And so those friends dried up, right? And he decided he had to get a job because, of course, a famine hits at that time because it's a story. So things are really bad for this young man. And he decides to go to work for a hog farmer. But it turns out that this hog farmer doesn't even give him the food that they feed their pigs. So he's working and starving all at the same time. And so he decides that it would be better off to return to his father. Because even if his father treated him like a slave or a servant, he would be at least get a meal to eat and wouldn't be starving. And so he heads home. All the way, you can see him on the journey, right? Have you ever had one of those conversations that you know you don't want to have? So in your head, you're saying over and over again what you're going to say to the person to help have them forgive you, right? You practice that speech until you get the words just right. And so he's got the speech down. And as he's walking up the lane to his parents' house, his father spots him and comes running out. And he starts the speech because he's got it. It's down pat. But his father just envelops him in love, hugs him, and calls the servants to bring over some clothes and some shoes and to start a feast to celebrate, to celebrate that this son who was dead is now alive, this son who is lost is now found, to celebrate. But that's when we meet the other lost son. The son who's always done everything right who has been the ones his parents rely on for everything. The one they turn to when they need something fixed in the house. The one who helps carry on the business. The one who is always there for whatever the parents need. That son has been out doing the job they sent him on and approaches the house and sees a party. Now, he's the good son and always is there. So how can there be a party that he doesn't know about? Because you know the parents would have had him setting up the tables and making sure all the glasses were filled. And yet there's this party and he is not part of it. And his father sees him and invites him to come into the party. And that good son, the son who always does the right thing, is so angry when he finds out that the party is for his younger brother who squandered everything that parents had given him. And he's angry because his parents have never seen him the same way, have never celebrated him. He's just the one who's always there. And the father says, how can we not celebrate? How can we not celebrate that the one who is dead is now alive, the one who is lost is now found, and invites him into the party? Because those words about being lost are also being said to him. He's invited into the celebration, and yet he can't say yes.
What if we were the church? What if we were the church who threw parties for the lost? What if we became known as the church that welcomed you no matter what? What if we became the church that when you were lost, we became a safe space to sit down? That we became the space that says, no matter what, grace, you are forgiven for whatever it is. Here, here in this space, the lost are welcome. The lost are find a home. The lost are invited to a party. look like in reality. In the chapter about St. Rose, they also tell the story about Jessica's church, where there was a young girl who was 17 and got pregnant and decided to keep the baby. And she tried to go to the parents group that met at the church. But she ran into a couple of barriers. One was, she was 17 and had a baby, so she didn't have money. And so that entrance fee to join the mother's group was more than she had. And when she had gone there, what she discovered is they were doing those humble brag kind of things, like my kid got into this Montessori school, and my kid's in this percentile, and my kid brought home this amazing piece of artwork. I mean, there are two. You know what that piece of artwork looks like, right? But they didn't deal with the things she needed from a mother's group. How do you afford the formula? Where can you get help with diapers? How do you make sure that this kid grows up healthy when you have so little? The question she had about little things like doctor's visits and what kind of books to read. The questions that she struggled with weren't the questions that those mothers were asking. And so she was left out on her own. But when she was 27 and her child was 10 and she was in a different place in her life, she went to the church and said, I need to start a different mother's group. I need to start a mother's group that is for people like me, where they can turn to who need the answers, the answers that I couldn't get from the people around me about where to turn for financial assistance, about all the ways to learn to take care of your baby that you didn't know because you never had them. A group that was for young mothers, a group that was for adopted mothers, a group that was for single mothers, a group that was for foster mothers. She started that group and the church became a place that welcomed those who were lost on the outside that brought grace to parents who often feel so alone and without hope. What does it mean to throw a party, to offer grace, to grant forgiveness, to welcome the lost? Maybe that's the question we need to stick with us that those people who we haven't yet invited or yet welcomed in, those who are lost and alone, those who are frightened, those who've done everything right and feel rejected, those who have escaped what was hard, maybe we need to be that safe space to land, that place when they're feeling like no one will miss them, we say you're welcome. 
Amen.